awesome. Um, um, so just to introduce myself, my name is Zoe Katari. I'm 18 years old. Um, I'm from Bombay, but right now I'm studying in Italy at UWC Adriatic. I'm a senior. Um, I'm very passionate about anti-ableism and accessibility. So currently I'm working on a platform dedicated to building empathy and awareness surrounding disability. Uh, it's called ZIE and it will be screen shared probably after the questions. Yeah, that's me. Nice. Hi, um, I'm Janani, I'm 15, and I'm really interested in using tech to fight climate change. So I go to the international school in Bangalore, and I've built two Chrome extensions that can show you your carbon footprint from your Google Maps or Google Flights trip, and also show you the way to offset it. And um, I've also recently built a Chrome extension for Amazon that picks out potentially toxic materials and what you're going to buy and instead recommends sustainable products that you can buy apart from Amazon. Wow. I'm a huge okay. fan of both these projects, so that's really cool. We got accessibility, we got climate change, giving me hope for the future. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, let's get started, so yeah. Okay, cool. So the first question. So you're a very successful woman in tech and in STEM. Do you have any advice for young women looking to study and work in male dominated fields, especially fields with a boys club culture? Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> so um, one thing I would say is um, that there are so many things that are great about working in tech. And I think the projects that both of you outlined are a perfect example of that. So just stay focused on the power of what you're doing and, um, and the joy. And, you know, it's easy to let things be a distraction that, um, that aren't the work itself. And so when I think too much about, you know, what's going on in the office and there's a dynamic that's, you know, really troubling and, and I'm not saying you can always just like put on a happy face and ignore it there, but, um, but as you're dealing with things that are really challenging, if they come up, make sure that, you know, one, what they call self-care or whatever is just to reconnect to the work and realize that's what, you know, originally drew you to the space and um, is what you're passionate about. Um, another is um, to find ways, um, you know, to enjoy, like, I really enjoy working with all my male colleagues. I think it's fun to, you know, like, I love hanging out with nerds, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, so I would say, you know, one thing is just like in all aspects, um, remember why, why you're here. Um, another thing when, you know, when things go wrong or when someone has really hurt me, which, you know, doesn't happen a, a lot, but happens. <laughs> um, I try to uh, find ways to let that also motivate me. So, you know, Ellen says like, my haters are my motivators. You know, anytime I had um, a professor in college who I thought was really underestimating me in a way that, you know, was really hurting me, um, I decided to let that energy fuel me. It was like, well, now I have to show him, you know? So, uh, so I think finding ways to realize that, you know, like um, there can be a certain energy in the revenge of being a success. And there can be a certain uh, fuel of energy from the revenge of living your best life. You know, I think a kind of spiteful revenge is like, you know, that's kind of a mental poison that's not good to dwell on. But the kind of revenge that says like, 
you can do and say what you want, but I'm still living my best life here. You know, that can be a positive fuel that drives you forward. I think sometimes um, my teaching career, I've thought of as a kind of revenge fantasy against the way I was taught. You know, a lot of the classes that I had, I think the the professor's mentality was, um, I'm going to set up all these roadblocks and hope that most of the class fails. And, you know, by the end, there will be these few bedraggled survivors of what I've set up, you know, as far as workload and exams in this course. And then, and then we'll celebrate, you know, with those few successful and, you know, and I was a good student. So I often was one of those that made it through. Um, and then at the end, when the professor kind of, I think, wanted to say like, and now we're buddies, right? And I felt like, no, we're not friends. You were just really mean to me and you did a bad job teaching. You didn't actually teach at all. You just tried to weed people out, you know? So, um, so I was very angry about that approach, um, that instead of saying as a teacher, my job is to build people up and impart skills to them and create experiences where they can maximize their growth and potential, um, where it just felt like, um, we were succeeding in spite of that way we were taught. Um, I, yeah, I, I was angry about that. And so I thought, what's the best revenge is just to go out there and show everyone that there's a different way and that you know, my students can be just as um, competitive out there out after my class, but having um, an experience that's a lot more uh, supportive. So, so those are the kinds of, you know, pivoting to take anything that goes wrong. And, um, and then the last piece of advice I would say is network, network, network with people who will support you. Um, find your group of like-minded friends, whether there are other women in tech or, you know, just um, males who like really believe in you also. And um, because that's what you need if you ever need to leave a bad situation, right? So um, making sure that you always have, um, you know, like an exit plan um, can take a lot of the stress out. Um, and so like in Silicon Valley, um, you know, there's people say you should have like this fund, which is like, you know, so many months that, uh, that you could support yourself if you just had to quit your job because something, you know, was, went really awry and, um, and that's a luxury, you know, but, but we do, um, or sometimes are afforded some luxuries in this industry, but, um, having knowing you could do that makes every day a lot less stressful that makes a lot of sense thank you i like what you said about um using the hate to motivate you sort of like a like a backstory sorry i'm a little bit of a marvel nerd so like sort of like a backstory <laughs> but yeah, very cool yeah, I thought it was really amazing, like how you took your bad experiences and used it to improve your style of teaching. That was really cool. Um, all right, so how do you address microaggressions in a classroom? Like, for example, if a girl is being congratulated on simply doing well as a girl, like, or oh, you're the best girl rather than just a student. And does it happen often? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, oh, my cat would like to say hello. Say hi. Okay. Um, so <laughs> he just jumped on the table. So uh, microaggressions in the classroom. I would say the most common form that I see is, um, and there's something, you know, I, I imagine this happens in classrooms on any subject, but I think there is something about the culture of computer science um, and coding that makes it 
feel like it happens a lot more in our classrooms, which is the question that's not actually a question. It's just wanting to show off, you know, that you know something. So um, it's actually one of my coworkers, uh, Maran Sahami, um, who I believe has been a speaker um, for this as well, um, had this um, great practice that he passed on, which is that as an instructor, um, he'll he'll respond by first saying, hey, um, you know, to the rest, before I answer that question, I just want to say to the rest of the class that those 10, you know, jargon words that you just heard, um, they're not part of the vocabulary of this class. If you don't know what those words mean, you're not behind. Um, and then, you know, provide a very quick answer to the question and then mostly say, like, we can talk about that after class. Um, but there does seem to be this kind of, it reminds me of like um, birds, you know, showing off their tail feathers, like these kind of <laughs> displays of, you know, conspicuous nerdery that, um, that, you know, taken in the right spirit, I guess, can be kind of fun. But when you're just starting out can be very deflating if you're a student in the class and you hear what is, you know, your competition or your fellow student appears to know much more than you do. It can be, um, it can be the kind of thing that can shut down um, a student's self-confidence. And I have to say, as an instructor, it's, rarely true that the person doing that kind of thing actually is more talented in the class. Like, I don't only see what's being said in the classroom. I also see the grade book behind the scenes. And I can tell you that those kind of showing off questions are not correlated with the numbers. <laughs> so, uh, so just a little heads up if you ever encounter that kind of behavior in class, um, don't let it get to you. But, but there is a role for instructors to play also to, you know, as, um, Maren set that good example of um, showing leadership and clarifying for the whole audience um, that that's not really necessary. So. That's super cool. Thank you for the heads up. And uh, in general, just like doing that seems really nice to your students. Um, so the next question. So in your Vox article responding to the infamous Google memo, you write about women with the potential to work in tech being um, chased away from tech by sociological and other factors, which there's no denying that that's true. Um, what would you say would be the most promising solution or method to dismantle the system within the field of tech? Mm, great question. Um, you know, one thing I would just say um, it's not a specific solution, but more sort of a way of thinking about categories of solutions. And that is that um, there's sort of a category of solution that says, um, let's run workshops for women. Let's, um, you know, give trainings. Let's talk to women about things like um, imposter syndrome, which is where you think, you know, that that you don't really belong and and one there's this constant fear that you're going to be found out and exposed as like someone who doesn't know what they're doing which by the way like everyone feels like they don't know what they're doing all the time so it's, you're not an imposter but um you know so that's sort of one category solution is basically let's fix the women so somehow like build a stronger armor around them so they can go into spaces that are challenging. And, um, you know, and I've gained um, personally from efforts like that. And, and I think they have their place, but I don't think that the solution, you know, the problem will ever fully go away until we look at a category of solution, which is let's fix the environment. So, you know, instead of saying, well, we'll just, you know, make like little coats that 
ducks can wear so that they're safe from oil spills. Maybe it's like, maybe we shouldn't spill oil in the water, you know? So, um, so I think organizations, you know, since the Me Too movement have been um, taking more seriously the responsibility to get out truly toxic individuals, which, you know, are a tiny minority of the workforce, the kind of men who would um, aggressively harass uh, women and that kind of thing, but it only takes a tiny minority, but, you know, it was very prolific, tiny minority in, in the, um, how they bother people to cause a real problem. So I think, um, that new, um, willingness and assertiveness on the part of organizations to, um, to remove people that are causing a problem is just import, as important as adding more women. So, um, so I think that's, that's what I'd like to see more of is, um, you know, fewer let's run a coding camp for 12 year old girls and more let's re um, evaluate how we choose um, people for promotions to higher executive positions within our company to make sure that women are being promoted, you know, equally. And so um, I think, you know, women are smart. We know, we know a good thing when we see it. So I think if tech is able to make itself a good thing, um, there will be that natural draw. So and I would say like all these reforms make things better for men as well. I've talked to a lot of men who feel like they were bullied at work and nothing was done about the person who was bullying them. I know a lot of men who feel like their boss just had a real, you know, like anger management issues, but, you know, higher up viewed that person as, you know, real stellar performer. And so um, the toxic environment that they were creating for people under them was, you know, excused and overlooked. And so, so I would say women, just because we're, you know, a minority in the industry, when, when there are illnesses like that in the organization, um, we're kind of the first to really get sick. Um, but um, but that doesn't mean it's healthy for everyone else either, you know. And so I I had I like to remind everyone that um, doing things that make things better for women, um, make things better for disabled folks, make things better for um, folks that you know grew up. Um, not financially privileged, you know, all these kind of things um, will really make things better for everyone. That's awesome. That's awesome. So like, rather than improving the people who've been harmed, you have to improve the system as a whole to prevent it from happening again and kind of stop it from happening in the first place. And so I loved your guide online on how to create a more inclusive community within CS. And I found it so inspiring that you made multiple mentions of using the they them pronoun as to not assume anyone's gender. Um, could you please tell me more about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, that document, there's a reason I made it a Google Doc, which is instead of like a PDF that I distributed, um, which is that I want to keep adding things. And, you know, it started off focused on women and, um, and racial minorities within the United States. And, um, and then over time, people would say, you know, well, what about this? And what about this? And so um, that was something that um, I really appreciate a, coll a colleague raising is um, that more and more folks um, identify themselves as neither male nor female, um, but um, something else entirely or in the middle or just a different thing. And that, um, 
they face a lot of barriers to um, to feeling like they really belong in the classroom or worrying that um, people will see this as kind of a phase or a fad rather than really who respecting that as who they are. So, so anytime I hear something like that, um, it's something that, that I wanna add to the document and make part of our culture. And I will say like, I, um, one of my very best friends who actually spent the entire day hanging out with yesterday um, uses they, them pronouns. So, so it's a thing that um, I love learning about this stuff because then these really cool people get added to my life that, you know, wouldn't be my friends and coworkers otherwise. So, um, so yeah, if anyone has any suggestions, always send them my way. <laughs> and let me get to know you because he's probably a cool person if you have a suggestion for that list so <laughs> super cool thank you so much um the next question so you do a lot of work to make um like the field of computer science and tech like in classrooms more inclusive um and i think when we talk about women and other minorities in the computer science community the ideal scenario would be for the community to be as diverse as possible so that it would be the most inclusive um so let's say we did have this reality let's say you know this goal was achieved what do you think tech could do then to build social equity in a world where you know this is the norm yeah so um so i will say like uh, as far as you know, what what is the goal? What is the end state? Um, part of it is I'm just very protective of you know people like my friend who uses they them pronouns, you know, um, who also works in tech, by the way. Um, and so so there, it, it's a very like me as one person connecting to one person and wanting, you know all these individuals to be comfortable um and and welcome in the workplace because i care about them um but i i think it's more than that though um you know in many ways as tech workers we're very very privileged like the pay is great compared to so many other industries that um you know, the style of work is, you know, you can get tendonitis in your wrist, but, you know, it's very different from farm labor or, you know, other things um, that that can really destroy a body young, you know. So, um, so I would say, you know, this, this would not be a cause I would dedicate my life to if it was just like, let's take these relatively privileged um, white collar workers and make sure that their lives are, you know, removed of things that were making it uncomfortable. I'm, it's always a good thing to remove ways people are hurting, but that's not, um, I think, uh, something I would devote this much of my life to. The reason I have is because of what was in your question, the what comes out of Silicon Valley. So you look at like the influence that, for example, Hollywood has and the kinds of um, movies that come out of, you know, this one tiny neighborhood of one city in the United States and is consumed by billions of people around the world. And the, um, which stories get told and how they get told and how different characters in them are portrayed sets a tone and a culture for billions of people. So, um, so I think that's a good analogy where Yes, you want it, you know individual writers and directors and actors um, in Hollywood to not face discrimination and to have good working conditions and for that to be inclusive for the sake of people who work in Hollywood. But the real reason you would want to care about that is um, to have a diverse and inclusive and healthy environment there is because of how that radiates out to everyone else. And tech is very much the same way. The products that we make ends up in the pockets 
of people around the world, the things that we make control how people work and sleep and um, how police do their jobs, how militaries around the world um, do exert their powers, you know, so, um, so you really almost need to think of people who work in tech as like this, you know, UN, <laughs> where it's really important that everyone has a seat at the table and that impacts of these products on different people are well understood by decision makers because representatives of groups are at the table. And, um, and it's so important to have that direct representation. I think empathy is a really important value. I could go on and on about how coding itself is an exercise in empathy because you have to put yourself in the shoes of the computer and think how it thinks, not how we naturally think. But, um, but empathy only goes so far. And I would say there are a lot of misguided um, sort of want to be benevolent, but end up really harming the people they were meant to help um, kind of attempts at tech out there where people who don't belong to a community thought, I'm going to help, you know, people by making such and such app, and, you know, and it backfires in, in a way that they didn't anticipate because they're not part of that community. So, um, you know, and then, and that's just the well-meaning ones that are the outright attempts at exploitation and control and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, um, in the future, oh, well, in the present, um, but continuing in the future, everything is controlled by software. And so we have to make sure that software is controlled by people and by the right people. I love that, thank you. Yeah, you're right. It's so important, especially because tech is a field that affects everyone, you know, like not just a certain group of people. So um, what's a major lesson you learned from your time at Stanford? And what would be some of the traits you find in your most promising students? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing that strikes me most about, well, a couple of things about Stanford students. One is, um, you know, when I, when I accepted the job and, and was first arriving on campus, of course I expected um, the students to be really smart, really talented, um, and they were. That was a surprise. But I think part of me expected them to be um, sort of arrogant in proportion to their talent, you know. <laughs> um, and um, of course, it's never good to be arrogant out of proportion with your talent. <laughs> and, but um, but I expected them to at least be arrogant proportion to their very sizable talent. And what I found. Um, was a group of people who were so humble, so gracious, so, um, you know, the kind of um, arrogance and, and obnoxious self-promotion was just not part of the culture. And, um, and that really taught me an interesting thing about, you know, the most talented people tend to be a little um, understated you know, it kind of goes back to the, the question in the classroom. People who are really like flashing their tail feathers at you, it's like, those usually aren't the very best um, of talents, you know. That's, I have to say, you'd have to do a little self-promotion, especially women aren't always socially conditioned to do uh, the kind of self-promotion that's necessary. So, um, so don't think you have to hide who you are or anything, but um, maybe what I mean is less, um, about, you know, not talking about what's good about yourself, but more also talking about what's good about others, you know, of generosity of sharing, um, and promoting others and looking always wherever you are looking one step down, um, on the ladder 
and saying, how can I take the people who are there and help them get up to where I am? And, and that's what I saw a lot of that kind of graciousness of um, realizing, hey, you know, I'm lucky to be here. I've worked hard, but I'm also really lucky. And so let me see how I can share some of that luck. Um, it was very much the attitude and I really liked that. Uh, the other quality that, um, that I noticed is um, just a very shortened distance between coming up with an idea for something to do and actually doing it. So um, this struck me the most when um, it was just in my first you know, month or two at Stanford and a student had come to my office hours um, just to introduce themselves and, and you know, get to know me or whatever. And, um, and we were chatting about um, how the, at that time they were uh, applying for and interviewing for internships for the following summer. And, um, and I just kind of mentioned offhand, oh yeah, you know, the university I worked before I came to Stanford, I taught this little workshop on, you know, how to do um, software interviews. And, um, and the student said, oh, wow, you know, that'd be really cool to have that here. And I said, you know, oh yeah, you know, that would be cool. And, but to me, it was just a little like idle chatter, you know, like, oh, that'd be cool, you know. Um, so, <laughs> so the next day, the student comes back to my office hours and says, okay, so I went to the registrar and I found out the process for creating a new course at Stanford. And here's the form that we have to fill out. And um, I went ahead and wrote up like a draft of the proposal, but I left some blanks where, you know, since you, you know, would only know how to fill in these details. And, um, and I hope it's not too presumptuous, but I went ahead and put together like the skeleton of a website for the course, you know, and like, <laughs> and it was just like, here I am just sort of like, oh yeah, you know, I'm thinking like sometime in the next like three years, you know, I might have it on my to-do list to create this course. And the student just went from idea to like, here's the website and the forms in 24 hours, you know? And so, um, and it's not that it was an incredible amount of work. It was just, there is a drive in the most successful students to, um, to stop talking and thinking and just start doing um, that, that continually astounds me. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I love that. So that was CS9, right? Yes. <laughs> I took that course the very first time it was offered. Well, you have that student to thank because it would have not you, come about yes, for absolutely. another two or three years after you had graduated. <laughs> That's <laughs> amazing. For that student. <laughs> yeah, that, that's super cool. And it sounds like a great student community also, if that's the case. Um, okay, so... I'm 18 now, but when I was 16, I was in an accident that I'm still sort of living with chronic health issues while recovering from, um, like chronic pain. And like as a student going through that, um, I just faced a lot of challenges and even some like ableism myself, which, you know, like you were saying about using like your hate sort of to fuel uh, what you do next. So that's a lot of what more motivates me towards working with like anti-ableism um so yeah the recovery really opened my eyes up to also my privilege most of the time um so that's what motivated me but I wanted to ask are there any specific experiences which you would be willing to share that motivated you towards advocating for inclusivity of minorities in tech Yeah, um, well, so one thing I can share is that um, actually was um, one week ago, two years ago, um, I was in a very bad bicycle accident and, um, uh, you know, couldn't move. I broke five ribs, three vertebrae. Um, 
smashed up a bunch of other ones. Anyway, so, um, and, um, and then I had to go back to teach. <laughs> and that first um, time back teaching, you know, I had, I was, um, I had mobility challenges. Um, I also couldn't lift anything more than about four or five pounds. So, um, um, so suddenly I couldn't get anywhere without um, a wheelchair ramp. I was not in a wheelchair, but I had to, because I couldn't lift anything, um, I had to pull like a suitcase um, with wheels for, um, for my laptop to give lecture. And one thing I found is that um, all the classrooms had um, wheelchair ramp um, accessibility for students. But the classroom that I had been assigned to teach in did not have any way to get onto the podium stage with a ramp. And that I thought was interesting that we make assumptions about like, that are these um, kind of condescending attitude towards like, oh, well, we can help people who have disabilities, but but that's us, like the normal folks, like being nice and helping them with this implication that it's a them and that there's something sort of less than it. That it's really symbolic um, that the power position in the room, nobody, it didn't occur to anyone that the person in charge of the class would have a disability, you know? And, um, yeah, so that really resonates. Um, other experiences I had, um, I'm gonna have my own, just being a woman, you know, experiences of um, really inappropriate harassment um, from coworkers. Um, and then um, of course that, any experience that I've personally had is gonna be, you know, about, this <laughs> big of the piece of a much bigger pie. And so um, as I kind of talked about earlier, um, the way, you know, that I've grown in my understanding is just by being very intentional about seeking out, getting to know people who are very different from myself and really listening to what is going on in their lives? What are the hardships that they face? Um, you know, that's, so there's actually another class that I created um, uh, based on that. Um, in fact, well, so the interview class came about originally because I was, um, talking to a student who had become very close to was, you know, one of my students that was really like a friend. And, um, and we were talking about their job search. And, um, and they mentioned, you know, oh, I'm not sure what to do about this. And, and it was a thing where I was like, wait, no, that's not how you approach an interview. No way. <laughs> <laughs> and the, yeah, they were really missing out on something that would have made their job search way easier. And, and that I sort of assumed everybody knew about. And, um, and that student said, well, you know, I'm the first person in my family, you know, generations to go to college and no one in my family really has like white collar jobs. So much less tech. So yeah, I, you know, how was I supposed to know that? And I realized um, that the way that that information was disseminating was um, informally, it's not the kind of thing that gets taught in a class. It's just the kind of thing that people share with each other in more informal network settings. And that a lot of students didn't have access to those networks, um, either through their parents or just because they both have, you know, kind of privileged backgrounds, even as students, they would connect to each other more likely and so on. 
So, um, so it was through that, through having people in my life that I really had begun to see um, their struggle as my own because I just cared about them as an individual that these kinds of things, you know, were coming to my attention. So, yeah. Oh, that is so inspiring. So there's been a huge uproar post Timnit Gibbers firing from Google. So how can we reasonably expect young black and brown women to feel that there's space for them in the world of CS when a researcher who's also a woman of color who was just voicing their concerns ended up being fired by one of the most important tech companies in the world? Yeah. Um... Yeah, that story is heartbreaking and angering in so many ways. Um, in part because, you know, th this isn't just a worker voicing concerns that that was her job was to identify concerns and spec them out in detail and suggest fixes, um, you know, like what can be more discouraging than being fired for doing exactly what your job was supposed to be, you know? So, um, yeah, and I understand she was speaking out more on more broadly than just, um, you know, the issues with specific technologies, but also the environment that was at the company and so on. But even that I very much view as part of her job. Um, the, you know, we talk about, I've talked about, you know, in this meeting that the um, a purpose of primary purpose of having um, diverse workforce is that um, the unique perspective that each person brings to the organization is this huge asset. Um, having people who can bring um, flag issues um, within the organization that might go unnoticed um, by anyone else because of that person's background, that's a huge value add to the organization. And so, um, so it is very frustrating to see that um, companies on the one hand are saying that they want that and, and even putting in place, you know, Google has many programs in place that are, um, that are enacting that desire and bringing people on. But, um, but to see that and then also see at the same time that, you know, sometimes what those different perspectives have to the bring to the table is something that the table didn't really want to hear, you know, and um, yeah, I don't know that I have a positive spin on that. That story is just very, here's another cat, uh, very discouraging. Um, but um but, you know, I don't think that Timnit would want others to give up. So, um, so I think that has to be, you know, something that, um, that we remind ourselves um, and that young women of color remind themselves is that, um, that I don't think that's what she would want coming out of this. And, um, and we just have to find more effective ways to organize, right? There's, um, it will always be challenging to be the lone voice in an organization. And, um, and so really um, coming together and, um, and many people acting and working together is is the way to get things done. So, um, so I think anyone who's um, feeling upset and discouraged by that, which is very understandable, um, that kind of hater is motivator action that you should be motivated to do is 
find a bunch of people like you get organized and make sure that you are watching out for each other and working together. I think that's really good advice, especially for like as a young woman of color who's interested in tech. I think that's very good advice for sure. Um, so this is the last question before me and Jenny um, show you some of the projects we've been working on. But um, if you could go back in time and meet your younger self when you were a student at UC San Diego, um, is there any advice that you would give her? Mm. Um, I would tell her to sleep more. <laughs> I don't know. I, maybe that is also like some, a lesson that I really learned the hard way with the, the months and months and really is not fully, probably will never fully happen recovery from the bike accident is just a new appreciation for physical health, which is something that at the time I just very much took for granted that um, you know, pull three all nighters in a row. Sure. You know, like if I can, if I can physically do it, like I will, you know, and, um, and I think, you know, having a better sense of, okay, maybe you can, but is that a good idea? <laughs> you know, long-term, and even in the short term, uh, you know, just you're not doing your best work if your brain is not rested. Um, just physiologically, um, your mind and um, is needs its own care, and your physical body is connected to the working of your minds in ways that cannot be separated. And I think. Um, And I know like a response people could say is like, oh, sure, it's easy for you now from a position of, you know, success to look back and say, you should have not worked so hard, but maybe you only got where you are because, you know, you were working that way. So maybe the lesson really is like, oh, you know, when Cynthia was younger, she worked that way. So maybe I have to too. But I would actually really push back on that kind of conclusion. Um, I look back and I see a lot of inefficiencies in, in how I was doing things that, um, you know, if I really like pulled an all night, I never did three all nighters in a row, by the way, but, um, if, if I, but I did do a fair amount of one night all nighters and, um, you know, and then the next day I was trashed, right? I wasn't getting anything done. Or if I was, it was not, it was shoddy work because, you know, I'm just not all there. And so, um, so I think there was, um, um, a lot of harm, you know, to my health in the style of work that I had, but also I think actually I could have been even more, um, successful at what I was doing if I had been more efficient and um, realized, you know, I could get that same task that took me three hours to do done in one hour if I had been rested and hydrated and fed well, you know. And so, um, so that that's a big regret that I have. And I wish someone, you know, me as a time traveler could go back there and say like, let's rethink this style. But, but it was so glorified as part of the culture, right? That's how you really knew you were serious about computer science is like doing this really difficult grind. And um, I just see that now as a um, very ineffective and short-sighted. Yeah, I completely get what you mean, especially as someone who's like in like, college the last year of high school but um living in rest and residential school and dealing with health challenges that I never did before and I was like oh I can't work like this anymore like I like I wish I could but I literally cannot and I totally understand what you mean I think that's very good advice because I also saw how certain like habits that I formed I'll probably continue after I recover as well so I think that's very good advice Amazing. So I think this is the time that Zoe and Johnny are the most excited for. So Zoe, I'll share my screen and 
please walk through Cynthia what, what, what you've built. For everyone else here, this is a very immersive environment. Please jump in with questions. You all have my email. If you want suggestions on like how we can improve what we are building, that would be awesome. And we all want to build it together. So Zoe, can I share my screen? Yes. Awesome. Can you see it? Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Awesome. Okay, so this is a project that I've been working on. It's called ZI, Zoe's Inclusive AI. So ZI AI. Um, so ZI is a platform built with the aim of building empathy surrounding disability, um, primarily in able-bodied communities, but also as a resource for um, disabled people. So when you first visit the website, um, it starts with just defining ableism, ableist language, and sort of educating you on the correct terminology and how to be sensitive. Um, and then following these definitions, there's an anti-ableist language check where you can respond to prompts asking about your everyday language that you may use while like texting a friend, like in the first example. Um, so the website then evaluates whether your language uses any ableist words or phrases, and it explains why those words are considered ableist. So if you say like, it was insanely gorgeous. It says maybe don't use insanely just to say it was like unbelievable uh, and suggest some alternatives. So there's a few like that. And then after that, uh, there's some resources written by disabled folk that can help you become more aware and be a better ally. So there's these are stuff that I read through and it's sort of connected with some of my experience, but also I learned a lot from. Um, and it's very easy for someone who knows nothing about like ableism or disability to understand, which I think is really important. Um, and then you have some like graphs also for awareness and some more resources and articles. Um, the platform also includes an AI chatbot. So if you select a country from the list provided here, so let's say you say the US, um, the bot can then um, like tell you about laws in the country you selected that um, exist to like protect disabled people, like what they have to disclose in, at, to employers, what they don't and so on. Um, and then you have, it can also tell you about whether an institution you're a part of is inclusive. Like if you're a professor or if you're a teacher, you're like, oh, how can I make this um, school that I work at more inclusive, it tells you how. Um, so yeah, it gives you a, a checklist. And um, Manu, do you think I should read it out? Or is no, it? Sure, 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 definitely. Anything oh, okay, you okay, okay. Okay, sure. So I'll just read out like one or two. So one is about like emergency e exits being accessible because we talk a lot about like getting into the building, but like what about getting out, right? And then there's one, I think, about like feedback, being open to feedback from disabled students and students who are dealing with chronic health issues, because you can say you're, you can say you're accessible and inclusive all you want, but if you aren't listen, like willing to listen to feedback, it doesn't really mean much. Um, and then apart from that, yeah, so it's, it's a few different things, which you can check out if you're interested. And then after that, um, you can also like ask the platform to like guide you on how to support differently abled friends and family. So it'll, like, like suggest resources um, similar to the ones on the dashboard. Um, so yeah. And then you can also find employment opportunities in the country that you selected. So, so like jobs where you can like work from home, like it's a website, so it constantly updates. Um, and like jobs where you don't have to wonder about, oh, is this inclusive? Because they're, they're saying, hey, we are wheelchair accessible. You can do this, you can do this. Um, so yeah, this was my first time working with computer science and learning about programming from Manu. Um, and it really got me interested in using tech as a tool to talk about like awareness and activism, which I'm really passionate about. So that's pretty much it. I'd love to know your thoughts on it if you'd like.
I love it. I love how it combines um, a, a kind of exploration and self-reflection piece with, um, okay, and here's all the concrete actions and resources um, and how they're blended together um, in a useful way. And, and it sounds like you had a lot of fun with doing it. Like, you know, oh, sure, anyone can make like a list of links, but like, let's make a chat bot. So um, I love how that brings in, um, um, I don't know, there's something I think that just um, is, it makes a statement to put that in in the language of tech, right? And um, and and demonstrate, you know, here's here's who we are, and and we have this vibrancy, even to making tools for how to help our own community. So I like that aspect of it. Thank you. Janani, should I share my screen? Yeah, please. Okay. So here we go. I'll just close this off. Yes, Janani. So someone is making a terrible mistake. How do we help them? <laughs> right. So <laughs> okay. So you just um click on the extension. Mm -hmm. First and... let me wait, yeah. So basically it's called the conscious consumer and it's picked out, you know, all of these harmful materials like leather and it shows you like why leather is bad and why you shouldn't buy it, how it contributes to fast fashion. And it also recommends alternate websites where with sustainable products instead. So personally, I've always had like this problem, you know, when you're shopping and then you just, you want to shop sustainably but it's hard like you know you don't know where to go you don't know what to find and you, so you just usually take the most convenient option and go because it makes sense right so that's why i developed this extension um this was also my first like proper coding project and i learned a lot from manu and i learned a lot about javascript as well Yes, and um, and Johnny has built her own corpus of materials. So any material uh, that you pick and you click on it, and it will prevent you from making terrible choices. It's amazing. Fantastic. So yes, uh, which do you want to say something? Sorry. I was just gonna like I liked how it was framed not only in terms of the environmental cost but preventing you from making terrible fashion choices as well. So it's like it doesn't look good. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's exactly that's exactly it, right? Um, I think since I've always found you to be easily among the most inspiring people I've ever met, and I think I hope that Zoe and Johnny saw that, and everyone else in the room saw that today, right? I think you are the voice of building an empathetic institution in computer science one that is open to everyone and i really hope that the kids that we spoke with today like we continue cynthia's work right like like you know like the way impact happens is one person inspires 100 other people and they inspire 100 other people and so on and so forth right so with that said zoe Janmi, any last words for cynthia anything you want to say i know since they're on time but you don't mind we go for five minutes more is that okay yeah I just want to say like thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us and also just like look at our projects and give your opinion because you're very successful but also very inspiring and we really value your input so thank you so much and I really liked a lot of your answers to the questions like they really made me think which I really appreciate thank you yeah thank you so much like I learned so much from your talk today and it was so inspiring to me especially you know uh, as like a woman of color, it was really inspiring to see everything you've done and everything you're continuing to do. Amazing. Anyone else wants to jump in with some final words? Anything you want to, you guys want to say? I guess everyone's just happy and content. <laughs> <laughs> so and anything else, like it would be amazing. Cynthia, thank you so much for making the time. 
I, I loved your answers as well, especially I, I think the things that I really resonated with is the idea of coding itself being an empathetic exercise because you are coding on behalf of someone, which is fascinating. I loved your Hollywood answer because I, I completely agree that the goal isn't to only just protect people who are tech workers, but to enable them to build tech that better serves the entirety of the world, right? And I really hope that everyone here in this room will continue that mission forward. And Cynthia, thank you. I know you're so busy. Thank you so much for making the time for all of us. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Happy to join. Bye, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much.